Good morning. I feel quite loud there. <laughs> a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us for worship today. It is a beautiful day. It's nice and warm. My mother tells me it is baking down in Jamaica, so I know it's an extremely hot day today, more than normal. As we gather for worship today, I just want to take the opportunity to wish a happy birthday to, ooh, quite a few June-born people here. So we are wishing happy birthday to the June-born Deb Thomas, Flo Sparling, Valerie McPhee, Chris McPhee, Donna Corbett, Lynn Mitnoff, Cheryl Tedford, Faye Botham, and I don't know, if, did we miss anyone? Anybody here who's a June born? Okay, so we're saying happy birthday to all those wonderful June born people. And I offer you this blessing. I bless the day that you were born. It was a good day. And the world is better for having you in it. And we have lovebirds also in this month, because of course people marry in June. And I have listed here that Pierce and Deb will celebrate their wedding anniversary this month. And so to you and Deb, I say, I bless the day of your union. It was a good day. And your patience and kindness towards each other is a testament to the rest of us that marriage can work. So as we gather for worship today, it is Trinity Sunday, June is Pride Month, and it is a wonderful opportunity to give God thanks. So, welcome. We light this candle as a sign of God's spirit at work, spirit of love at work in the world. Let it remind us of our light and the difference it makes when we share it with those around us. The choir's introit today, Jesus, remember me. stand for the call to worship. Holy are you, source and creator of all things. We praise you for your gift of life. Holy are you, son and redeemer of all things. We thank you for your gift of new life. Holy are you, spirit and sustainer of all things. We bear witness to your truth and worship your holy name ever three and ever one. Rejoice in the Lord, you people of God. We come to worship with our hearts to offer our love and loyalty as your gathered people. Let us acknowledge the land together. We meet today on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Windat nations. We seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations with them as we live work and worship on their traditional territory. We are also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. 
Let us join our hearts as we sing from Voices United 639, One More Step Along the World I Go. That is in the red hymnal, Voices United 639. seated as we continue worship with prayer let us pray holy god you are three in one and one in three praise to you source of life maker of heaven and earth you created us in your image and called us good praise to you jesus christ born in our flesh to teach us how to love and offer us grace and mercy Praise to you, Holy Spirit, for the energy you bring us to greet each day as a gift. Holy God, three in one and one in three, we praise you for your mystery and mercy. Reveal to us how to live as your people. Join together this community and witness to others of your wonder and grace. God of mystery and mercy, you know the details of our lives. You see the sin and the sorrow we bear. You see the problems and the possibilities we face. You see how we fit into the world around us and how we rub each other the wrong way. We confess we do not always see what you see. Sometimes we choose to ignore what we do see and other times we make things worse. We acknowledge that it is not easy to live in community with others and too often our personal needs and issues take the lead in how we treat others. Forgive us for all the ways we knowingly and unknowingly sin against you and each other. Open our eyes to the truth of our lives and touch us with your grace. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminds us that now, from now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Thanks be to God that we can all make a new start through God's gift of forgiveness and peace. Amen. Or hymn of response as Voices United 364, Forgive Our Sins. That's also in the red hymn, though.
to each other, to your neighbor, to your right and to your left. Send them away. The peace of the Lord be with you. <laughs> Welcome to Seeds of Faith. I am Reverend Siddiqui. This morning as we think about belonging and we're going to talk about fellowship in our Seeds of Faith today and in our sermon today, I thought I would talk about the Trinity. One of the beautiful things about the Trinity is that the concept amplifies how together and separate is possible to be. It's a symbol of unity, but it's also a symbol of belonging. And I like to, one of the ways that I understand the Trinity is like this, that God is, God is. God is immeasurable. There is no depth, there is no width, there is no height to God. Kind of like this bundle of foil that I have made into a ball. I don't know how many pieces of foil I used to do it. You don't know how many pieces. We can't count how many ridges are in this foil, and we can't unravel it in any meaning unless we're gonna, and it's not gonna look like the way it started. So this is what I would consider the image of God. And this now is a tin foil. Tin foil what? cross I use as the symbol for Jesus. This cross is separate from God, but it is made up of the same substance, correct? Tin foil. So here, God and Jesus are one, yet they exist separately. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. So here is God, immeasurable, without beginning, without end. And then here is Jesus, the embodiment of God in human form. Are you still with me? Same substance, different presence. I won't give Greg any work. So this is tinfoil confetti. And I use this to symbolize the Holy Spirit. Light really doesn't have any presence because it's a spirit, but same substance, correct? Same substance. So this is how the Trinity is possible. Same substance, different presentation. Does that make sense? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> My philosophy teacher might say, oh, I can identify some logic missing there. But I say that to say that just as Jesus came from God and God came from Jesus and just as the Spirit came from God and is a part of Jesus, just as they are one, each of us are one. We all belong to God, being made out of the image of God. We all belong. Even if we don't want to belong to God, even if we don't want to have anything to do with God, that doesn't change that we belong to God. And because we belong to God, God cares and loves us, even if we don't want it. And if you have children or interact with your grandchildren, there are times where they don't want us to love them. <laughs> when they get older and they don't want you to butt into their lives. And older for me starts at about nine. <laughs> but they are still our children, even if they don't want us to be. And it's the same principle with God. We are a part of God. And so God cannot help but care for us. But that sense of belonging should also give us a sense that even if nobody cares about us, in a tangible human way, we can be sure of this one thing. I belong to God. I am a part of God's family. 
And if that is the only standard, then you are loved by one of the greatest entities that ever existed. Before the world began, God is. And that is whom and to whom you and I belong. You belong. You belong to God. And that is why this Jesus came for your sake. You belong to Jesus. And that is why he decided he wasn't going to leave us orphans, but that he was going to send the Holy Spirit, who stays with us until the very end. And you know how the story ends for us. Because we belong to God, even in the end, there is no end, but only a transition to return to the one to which we belong. You belong. See you next week. Bye. As we prepare to listen to the reading from scripture, we will stand and sing more voices, one, three, six, when hands reach out. More voices is a spiral hymnal. More voices, one, three, six, when hands reach out. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew 9, starting to read at verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And then continuing at verse 18. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came up and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I can touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. 
Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When he entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put us outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. None of, never, news of this spread through all the region. May God bless us to understand these words from Scripture. Thanks, Peter. Our choir music ministry today, give to us laughter. Let us pray. God, you have spoken through your living word. Jesus Christ, your spirit speaks through the scriptures. Grant us understanding through what we see in Jesus and hear in scripture, that we may know your will and follow your way. Amen. We continue our worship today with, we're talking about purpose, and last week we spoke about worship. And today we talk about fellowship. We were formed for God's family. You were called to belong, not just to believe. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says, God's family is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. In Jamaica, whenever a church gathers together, we sing, we are together again, just praising the Lord. We are together again in one accord. Something good is going to happen. Something good is in store. We are together again just praising the lord and if you can imagine tambourines and drums and we say that over and over again it's a it's a, one of those one-liner kinds of songs that you repeat but it's wonderful because the understanding of family and god's family in particular and specifically fellowship is that every time we gather as god's people it is an opportunity to not just build community but to affirm each person who belongs, who, who is a part of that community, and to help every person to feel that sense of belonging. 
We are created for community. We are fashioned for fellowship and we are formed for family. And none of us can fulfill God's purpose by ourselves. By our very design, even our very beings as human beings, we are designed for parts of us to work together. That's how we exist. Cells work together, bones work together, joints work together, the nervous system works together. All aspects of ourselves are by that design. And even as a being, we are designed to be our happiest and healthiest in communities with others. That's why none of us are born alone. We are born into a family. And that same principle applies to church, that you become a part of a church and then you are born into the family of God. So when we say, I wanna be a Christian, we're actually just acknowledging a family to which we belong to all along, because we always belonged. Ephesians 2 verse 19b says, you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. So not only are we a part of this family called Sharon Hope United Church, we are a part of a family of the United Church of Canada, we are a part of the family of all Christians all over the world in every part of every corner of every part of every part of the world. In Canada, we would say from coast to coast to coast and beyond, whichever sea you want to cross. The church is the body of Christ. That is how we get our belonging. So while your relationship with Christ is personal, God never intended your relationship to be private. In God's family, each of us is connected to every other believer, and we will belong to each other. Romans 12 verse 5 says, In Christ we who are many form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. I wonder how people feel about that, about belonging to each other. Is that kind of throws a different spin on how we treat each other? So we talk about membership. Whenever the image of the body of Christ is used in scripture, it is designed for us to develop an appreciation that each of us not only has value, that not only do we, are we a part of a family, not only are we entitled to be a part of a family, but we are vital to that family. Like a vital organ is vital to the living body, indispensable, interconnected, a part of the body, and in this case, the body of Christ. The church is a body, not a building. I think the pandemic tested that. The church is an organism, not an organization. We do organize things, but the church is an organism. And just like organs are essential for the body and if they don't work, it has implications for how the body functions, it's the same way when you and I don't function in the way that we should, it affects the body of Christ. Membership is The Bible says that a Christian without a church home is like an organ without a body, a sheep without a flock, a child without a family, to not be in fellowship with the other Christians is not the state of being that God intended for us. So while we can manage our faith on our own in front of a television screen, and we read our Bible every day, by design, 
God intended that the fullest way to become a Christian, adaptive, and to fully understand and live into the lessons that we have to live into, we need other Christians to do that. We need other people. In fact, one of the first symptoms of spiritual decline is inconsistent attendance in the gathering of God's people. Not just church, but other gatherings. Ephesians 2 verse 19b says, you belong in God's household with every other Christian. If you don't believe me, if you, ever, if you have a family member who does not attend family events, tell me how, what kind of relationship does that person have with the family? Church, why do you need one? Why is it important to be a part of a church or a part of a church family? One, it gives you identity. Being a part of a church family, one receives an identity, just as your connection to Christ makes you Christian. It's the distinction between being a part of a denomination. If you're a part of the United Church, there is a certain identity that comes with that. If you're a part of an evangelical church, there's a certain identity that comes with that because every, every organism has its own identity, its own values, its own ideas about how to relate to God. So you need a church for identity. You need a church to move out of isolation. In all the stories that you read this morning in the scripture, they had one thing in, in common, each of those individuals, Matthew, the girl who almost died, the woman with the issue of blood, all of them were separated from community. And what Jesus did was pull them out of isolation and bring them into community again. Until that woman's medical condition was treated, she could not be a part of community. Matthew was a tax collector. He was automatically ostracized by his profession. He was excluded from community. But Jesus included him. Being a part of God's family, being a part of a church moves us out of isolation. It's not by force, but it is a gift. You have the opportunity to give and receive support when you're a part of a family. Why do we need a church? Because it helps with your spiritual muscles. It helps you to develop your spiritual muscles. By being a part of a, of a church family, you and I develop full participation. Church is a lab to practice love. I tell you all the time, you can't learn patience unless your patience is tested. You can't learn to forgive unless somebody hurts you. A lot of the lessons and the ways of being that Jesus teaches requires that we interact with others. The safe part of that is if you're working within the context of a church family where everybody understands that we're all a work in progress, then that treatment, that growth works. So we can forgive you easier. So get in all the trouble you want in church. Practice in church. Be mean all you want. And then we'll teach you what forgiveness looks like. And then you leave and go and do the right thing on the outside with other people. Does that make sense? So this is the lab. No. <laughs> Susan says no. <laughs> well, we're assuming that if, if you're a part of the church family, you'll try to be nice, and then there'll be just tiny bits of mean. And so each of us will help each other to deal with and get rid of all the tiny bits of mean that we have in us. Does that work, Susan? <laughs> so it helps us to develop our spiritual muscles. And gradually, as you develop those skills, it strengthens your capacity to not just relate to people who are Christians, but also to relate to people in general. Why else do you need a church? To empower 
you to share in Jesus' mission. Of course you could do that. You could share in the mission to the world. You can do mission outside of the church. You can join one of Kiwani's club. You can join, if you're in the medical field, you can go and join the medical field and go off to some deserving country to offer eye tests and medical tests. You can do that kind of mission. There's lots of missions out there in the world because there's lots of need in the world. But Jesus' mission, mission that is driven by Jesus' ideals, are accomplished through the church. And what is Jesus' mission? It's two parts. Matthew 28, 19 to 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go out into the world and make people recognize that they belong to a family. Doesn't matter where they're from or who they are or what they look like, that word all means all. Doesn't matter what language they speak, that all means all. And in that process, make them feel included. That's what baptism is about, inclusion and reception and acceptance and affirmation and then teach them teach them the life that christ has taught and encourage them to teach other people that's the first part of the mission the next part of the mission is social luke 4 18 to 19 the spirit of the lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That is the social mission of the church. So we have an obligation because Jesus says we should care about the poor. We should care about those who are captive in whatever their situation is. We should care about those who are sick. We should care about those who are in need, those who need clothing, those who need shelter. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of our identity, and it is our mission at the same time. But the other reason why we need a church is because the church needs you. Just like the hand needs a finger, the church needs you. The church needs your time. The church needs your talent. The church needs your treasure, and the church needs your testimony. The next reason for a church is the church helps you to not just build your spiritual muscles, but also to help you to be firm in your faith. We like to call it, it's your crutch. People like to say, oh, don't, isn't believing a crutch? And that's fine, but if you have a broken leg, you have a deep appreciation for a crutch. If you have a rocking table and you get a piece of cardboard and stick a piece of cardboard under the foot of that and it stops rocking, God bless the crutch. You need the crutch, you need the church. And what the church does in times when we are not firm is through teaching, through worship, through fellowship, it all gives us and strengthens our faith in especially the times when we don't have enough in ourselves to do so. And that is fellowship. God intends for us to experience life together. And the Bible calls this shared experience fellowship. So every church should have opportunities to come together, to have spend time together. That is not about collecting money. That is not about some particular agenda but just to hang out and support and encourage and laugh and get to know each other doesn't always have to happen in large groups but it should at least happen in smaller groups because the design according to how god intended is that we must experience life together 
And if you have to be a secret Christian, like many Christians are these days, then the church is the one place that you can, what we call God speak, without people looking at you weird. You know, where you can say, I'll pray for you, and nobody goes, what are you talking about? Or you can say, thank God, and nobody looks at you weird. That doesn't happen to you. If, if I'm in a place and I'm not in a religious setting and I sometimes accidentally say religious things, <laughs> and people will look at me and go, oh, she's one of those people. <laughs> it's okay. I don't mind. I'm not particularly hurt by it. I'm just secret. But when I'm with my friends, people who are a part of the faith, it doesn't matter denomination or whatnot, then I can say, that's some serious sin you're doing there. I'm going to sin by having two slices of cheesecake instead of one. Fellowship is people experiencing life together. But the funny thing about fellowship is that fellowship that is authentic is not so, um, what we call surface level chit chat. It's a space in which we can be honest and loving and we can freely share and confess our doubts and our fears and our witnessing and our weaknesses and ask for help and prayer. So I am very happy when people, for example, say to me, you know, Reverend Siddiqui, I have a problem with the concepts of heaven and hell. Well, this is the perfect place to talk about that and not be ashamed of it. I'm not sure I believe in God in the fullest sense of the word, or there's a part about my faith that I have serious doubts about. This is the place, and in, in the context of fellowship is where you, you and I should feel comfortable to express those needs. And at the same time, when you, your grandchild has a birthday, or a new grandchild has appeared, or someone's getting married, or someone is having a birthday party, or someone has passed away, or someone's in a hospital, all of that is also included in experiencing life together. That is what fellowship should feel like. In fellowship, people experience authenticity. So we relate to each other, not just because we're in church, but because we genuinely care about each other's well-being. People experience mutuality. The same care you have for me, the same I have for you. And we respond accordingly. Our bodies are a model for us to understand our lives together at church. Every part is dependent on the other part. In fellowship, people experience sympathy. And sympathy is not a bad thing. And we call it empathy in modern times, but I think the Bible is still correct. It is sympathy. Sympathy produces or meets two needs. First, sympathy allows you to indicate to the person that you understand. And secondly, sympathy allows you to help to validate another person's feelings. So in real fellowship, there is sympathy. In real fellowship, there is mercy. We all need mercy. And by mercy, we're talking about forgiveness. Colossians 2 verses, Corinthians 2 verse 7 says, when people sin, you should forgive and comfort them so that they won't give up in despair. Leviticus 19 verse 18 says, never hold a grudge because bitterness and resentment always destroy fellowship. If all the things I've listed about fellowship were true, then it sounds like heaven, doesn't it? Sounds like that place where everybody is happy and people get along and everybody's kind and they care. But the truth is, the prayer we say every Sunday for sure, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in. It is God's intention that even our interactions with each other are fulfilled and are like they are in heaven. So how do we cultivate community? How do we cultivate fellowship? One, we need honesty. We will have to care enough to lovingly speak the truth. That's how we do it. Community also requires humility. We will have to care enough to shed self-importance and shed smugness and shed stubborn pride. Stubborn pride is a very difficult characteristic to shed because that is the part of us that helps us to present as if we have everything all together. Got it. Even when we're falling apart, just this one hour in service, I want to look like I got everything together. And then when I get home, I can fall apart. The truth is, in the context of fellowship, at least the one God intended, this is the place to fall apart because you're surrounded by the people who mutually will help you to put things back together. And if you don't, then you fall apart alone and nobody knows that you're falling apart. And then you develop resentment that you're falling apart at home and nobody cares. We're not assigning blame, but we are saying nobody knows. And that's what we call stubborn pride. Courtesy is essential for cultivating community. We have to care enough to respect our differences, be considerate of each other's feelings, and be patient with others who irritate us. I don't know, every time I'm driving, I'm irritated by the drivers. And I have to exercise a lot of courtesy to not bad drive them. You cultivate community through confidentiality, not in the rigid way that we think about confidentiality in our context of the formal sense, it HIPAA and whatnot, but in the sense that when people are willing to open up and share their deepest hurts and needs, your only reason for disclosure is to help, not to gossip. So Donna tells me her deep, dark secret I can share that if I'm going to help Donna, not even disclose who Donna is, but Donna needs a problem. There's a problem with Donna's toe. I need to find out if from somebody else. I'm going to ask Kathy if she knows anybody who looks after toes. So somebody in our church needs help with that. But I'm not going to tell them it's Donna who needs it. And then I'm going to use that information to help Donna with her toe. Confidentiality. It needs frequency. We have to care enough for frequent, regular contact with your group in order to have genuine fellowship. And it must happen by conviction and not convenience. We have to want together. We have to want to, to be together, to hang out together, and recognize that not only are we doing it for doing sake, but because we need it as a person. So we are formed for God's family. You are called to belong, not just to believe. And that belonging is experienced through fellowship that is authentic, that is mutual, that is sympathetic, that is merciful, and that is based on a relationship where we experience life together. Fellowship is cultivated through honesty, humility, and courtesy. And it is best when it is confidential, it is frequent, and those involved do it out of conviction and not convenience. You belong to God's family, and you have a purpose within it. And today that purpose and the reminder today that one of your purposes is to experience what it is like to fellowship. Amen. 
Next week, we will talk about our third purpose. We are made for mission. And speaking of mission, we're just going to have the minute for mission. The path toward healing, Murray Pruden's work. In late October 2022, the federal government recognized the residential school system as an act of genocide against Canada's Indigenous peoples. It was a reminder that we are still very much on the path of reconciling and healing. We know that we have an impact as a United Church, says the Reverend Murray Pruden. He is Nisha, Cree, First Nations, from the Goodfish Lake and Saddle Lake First Nations, and is the current Executive Minister for Indigenous Ministries and Justice for the United Church of Canada. And he was at our meeting last weekend. Supported by Mission and Service, Pruden has made significant gains in building relationships of trust and healing between the church and indigenous communities. After unmarked graves were discovered in Kamloops, BC in 2021, the United Church gave an additional $3 million to help indigenous communities respond, mourn, heal, and potentially find other unmarked graves. Because we believe every child matters, the funds are also supported the dedication of memorials to lost children, like one for a BC community that raised a totem pole funded in part by Mission and Service. Other healing initiatives include the translation of the Mohawk language Bible. This Bible is supposed to be ready in the fall. The Food for the North program, healing circles, and programs for Indigenous youth to learn and reclaim their languages. Just think how you would feel if you went to a foreign country, and although you learned to speak their language, you were not able to speak your own anymore. Pruden stresses the need for patience. Ever since Kamloops, we've had many non-Indigenous churches, church communities and people ask, what can they do? How can they contribute in different ways? He says, and we at the time really kind of put our hands up and said, whoa, we need to pause for a minute because we need to mourn. I think we still have so much to give, to teach, and to be in relationships with. And as long as we have greater understanding within the church and the supports, we can do it. Relationships, friendships, understanding, and trust. These are the foundations of the work mission and service are doing in Turtle Islands, thanks to your generosity. Sometimes we don't understand just how much and where our mission and service money goes. I was not aware that $3 million had gone to help with the healing fund. So I'd just like to close with this prayer. May we travel our lands in gentle ways, caring for creation as in turn she cares for us. May your light and love encircle and envelop us all. 
as we rest in the promise of your abundance. Go in peace with wisdom and gratitude. All my relations, Maget Rich. Amen. Trinity Sunday proclaims the outpouring of God's love within our being. For God's very nature is love. Trinity Sunday also celebrates unity, working together for the common good. May our gifts offer an opportunity for our love for God and our willingness to put that love into action in God's world together. We will sing Voices United 316, Praise or Maker, as the offering is collected. Let us pray together. God of overflowing love, receive our gifts as signs of our love and commitment to live for you. It is a symbol of our desire to work together to achieve your purposes in this church and our community. Bless our gifts and our lives that they may accomplish more than we ask or imagine as we follow Jesus equipped by the Spirit to serve you well and wisely. Amen. Please be seated. As we offer our prayers of the people today, we will sing We Are Pilgrims, Voices United, 4595. Let us pray. Lord our God, whose glory is beyond the compare, whose mercy is boundless and love for us is endless, look upon us now in your compassion for peace that calms our hearts and saves our souls. 
and for peace in the whole world and throughout creation. Lord, have mercy. Give us unity of purpose. For the stability of the church and the unity of this congregation, for the ministries of your church here and around the world in these challenging times, for the United Church of Canada, its leaders and ministries, Lord, have mercy. Give us unity of purpose. For our country, our leaders, and all those in public service, for this community and for every neighborhood and nation, and for all who offer themselves in service for the common good, Lord, have mercy. Give us unity of purpose. For the whole of God's creation in its beauty and bounty, for the well-being of every creature and their habitats. Unite us in willingness to change our ways to protect places and people at risk, and for generations yet unborn, that they too may thrive. Lord, have mercy, give us unity of purpose. For the safety of those who must travel by land, sea, and air, for those who long to travel but cannot, and for all those who are separated from those they love, Lord, have mercy and give us unity of purpose. For the sick, the suffering, and the isolated, for victims of violence, refugees and captives, and for our protection against all affliction, danger, and distress. We raise prayers for those among us who are celebrating remission from cancer, who are recovering from surgery, those who are preparing to go into surgery. Lord, have mercy and give us unity of purpose. To you, Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit belongs all glory, honor, and worship, now and forever, and to the ages. Hear us now as we pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn, More Voices 213, Take Up His Song.
receive the blessing. Trinity celebrates the overflowing love between God's very nature, a dance of unity and diversity in the heart of God. So let us join the dance and let God's love flow among us each day, binding us together with card cords that are hard to break. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit fill you with joy and lead you onward now and evermore. Amen. Our choral parting, more voices, 218. May the love of the Lord. Have a good week, everyone. Please sit for prelude, postlude. <laughs>